Hello everybody, this is the Doctor. Welcome back to some more Star Trek Online. This is a bit of a special video, something different, something I thought would be a lot of fun, and hopefully I'll get some good feedback on it, and you guys can definitely leave a comment and let me know what you think of all of my opinions that I am about to lay forth before you. This video is basically a shout out slash feedback video about the special mission Broken Circle. I've never done this before, but maybe this is something I'll keep doing in the future if there's a lot of feedback, good feedback on this. Uh, basically what I'm going to do is read your comments that you left on YouTube for the mission Broken Circle that I put up, my playthrough of it on YouTube. Uh, this is in Star Trek Online, of course. I'm going to read through your comments and answer your questions as sort of a voice log, a V-log, but not a video log. No, it's a voice log. So as you can see, here is my character, the doctor on screen. He will be uh, reading for us these comments. Um, I like this uh, fact that you can show his mouth moving as long as you're talking through a microphone. It's a, a voice chat feature in Star Trek Online I did not know existed. Thank you to whomever told me. I completely forgot who it was who told me that I could do this, but you know who you are, and it is because of you that I now have his lips moving while I am talking. How awesome is that? So, uh, yeah, if I had a webcam, I'd probably do this with a webcam. I don't. So this is just going to be a voice log. Hopefully, uh, that will be good enough. Okay, so what I'm going to do is say your name and read your comment from the comments on my video, Broken Circle. I'll put a link to it. And I'll read your comments, and then I will discuss it because I have a lot of input and feedback about the whole Iconian storyline in Star Trek Online and my thoughts and opinions on these missions so far and where I think it's headed and all that good stuff. Now, of course, you may disagree with me. We, we all have interesting opinions about this and it is just opinion, so please don't get offended. And uh, if you want to put your opinion in the comments, by all means, please go for it. Also, if I mispronounce your name while I'm reading it, please forgive me. It is hard sometimes to uh, see where these names are going in terms of translation. Anyway, let's get to it. I'm starting right at the top. By the way, I'm reading this from my laptop, so I kind of have to turn my head sideways. Hopefully you can still hear me. Okay, let's see. Um, Diego Diaz has a lot to say here, and he makes some good points, and I want to comment on that. I kind of did already in the comments, uh, but I want to comment about that a little more. Okay, it says, Brent. Okay, first of all, the first thing I said uh, in the video was, why are they so concerned about going after this flagship, this Iconian flagship? Uh, why specifically this one and not any others? Okay, so Diego Diaz says, Brent, this is a flagship. That's like if an enemy was boarding the Enterprise, Lissette, or Bortus. It's not just a dreadnought, it's a flagship. I understand the overall disappointment of the mission, but yeah, I'll let that sink in, which I'm sure you thought about for a bit. Okay, good point. It's a flagship. That is a worthy ship to capture. If you're going to capture an enemy ship, well, yeah, capture their flagship. But, 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 to that I say, wouldn't the flagship also be the hardest ship to, to take out or take over or commandeer? Wouldn't you want to maybe spend your resources going after a smaller ship? Maybe one that's not as important, but would still contain Iconian technology and information in the database and everything that could still help them in the war. It just seems like going after the flagship is like, 
you know, something that you would do at end game as far as the war goes, not something you would do toward the beginning or whatever. It seems like, you know, pick up a cruiser, pick up one of their fighters, you know, something like that to help you learn. Uh, it just seems that it's a waste of resources sending the entire fleet that you've built up over a lot of time to just take out a flagship. And then in the end, we even failed at that anyway. So, you know, it's a big expenditure for that. I would have gone after smaller targets, uh, multiple smaller targets perhaps. Also, a flagship is only a flagship because of a, a because of name. Typically, flagships don't have like special intelligence information or technology or whatever. Typically, a flagship is just that by name. For example, example the Galaxy class Enterprise D, the one that Picard flew was the quote flagship of the Federation. But there was nothing different about it than any other Galaxy starship. If an enemy wanted to gain information about the Federation, they could have captured any Galaxy-class starship, not just the flagship. I mean, it would be kind of prideful to capture the flagship, but there would have been no advantage capturing the flagship versus another Galaxy-class ship. So flagship is really only a flagship by name and not extremely important in the grand scheme of things. It's more of like a prideful thing. It seems like something a Klingon would certainly do, I guess. You know, for honor, for glory. We got the flagship. Hoo-ha! But, you know, it really doesn't gain you a whole lot unless there's something specifically different about the flagship that sets it apart from all the other ships. And in this one, I could maybe believe that. Uh, however, we've kind of learned that all their ships use Omega Particles anyway. So, I don't know. That's my thoughts on that. You can let me know what you think if I'm crazy or whatever. Diego Diaz says, By the way, the Herald Sphere is the sphere at Iconia. It jumped from the Andromeda Galaxy all the way to the Iconia system in Uneasy Allies. Good point. I did mention that, uh, you know, they've got all these spheres out there. Why are they worried specifically about this sphere? Um, so the one that we were at was at Iconia. I don't think it was made that clear in the mission. I wish it were. It were not, but I wish it was. So apparently, I guess that was the one in Iconia, and that was the sphere that jumped from Andromeda. We do know from that mission on Easy Allies, it's one of the oldest spheres the Iconians have. So in that sense, it's important. Uh, but they it's not the only sphere they have. They've got many Dyson spheres and probably many more with ships in them, millions and millions of ships. Remember, the size of a Dyson sphere, I, I mean, really, it can be any, any size. But the Janolan Dyson sphere, for example, is about the size of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. That's extremely large. So if you keep that kind of scaling in mind, they could have billions of ships inside these spheres. So if they have that many ships, where are they? Why haven't they used them? Why haven't they attacked Earth? Where are the Iconians? What are they doing? And we'll talk more about that because that's I got a beef, beef with the Iconians about that one. Uh, Diego Diaz goes on to say an explanation, pure speculation here, he says, for the ship question about being tied to the Iconians is that those ships are all using Omega, Omega particles to power the ships and the Dyson gateways. I think the Iconians feed on that energy instead of generating their own, suggesting that once in their evolution they were not energy beings, which is backed up by the fact that the preservers created the Iconians. They stated that they made every uh, that they made every being seated by them in their own image, in which case they became energy beings as their natural evolution or some cataclysm caused them to become what they are now. Um, which ties into the whole cataclysm with the Solene and them leaving the Dyson Gateway behind. It's all tying in nicely, except for one thing, he goes on to say. The Preserver Archive is gone on, Le on Leon Leonis 3, but that wasn't the only archive with preservers in it. There was another one. 
if you play the Breen Arc cold case, we found a different mini archive with preserver pods. So we can still wake the preservers and ask them. Cryptic have yet to resolve that issue. I'm going to have to go p back and play that mission. So cold case, everyone. Uh, let's go back and look at cold case. Are there preservers in pods there that we could wake? If so, that is a big plot hole that uh, Cryptic needs to answer because supposedly the preservers all died on Leonis 3, but if hey, if there are some here left in that mission cold case, let's go get them, wake them up, and ask them about the Iconians again. Um, so I also think the Iconians were not energy beings at first. They were probably flesh and blood, just like you and me. Uh, also the same for the Q. The Q continuum, we know, were also flesh and blood. So yeah, I think they started as flesh and blood. Um, but then at some point during their evolution, they became energy beings, kind of like, again, uh, this is very spoilers, going back to Babylon 5. I, I really relate this story, excuse me, this story a lot to Babylon 5. So here's a bit of a spoiler. If you've never seen Babylon 5, close your ears right now. Um, it, it, I, the humans, well, Vorlons, humans, yeah, whatever, in, in Babylon 5, eventually become energy beings too, to where the point where we need encounter suits. But it takes like millions of years or whatever to get to that point. So the Iconians, being one of the oldest races in the universe, I guess, that the Preservers created, would have had the time to become energy beings just like the Q continuum, just like the Vorlon, just like the humans in Babylon 5. Over time, they would have, you know, became energy beings. So I like this idea that they are energy beings and they're almost like an encounter suits. That's the way I look at their skin and their skeleton or whatever that they have. It's like a magnetic, think of it like a magnetic suit holding in everything, holding in all the energy. And without it, the energy would just be expended. It wouldn't stay in one place. They're probably not as advanced as the Q because the Q are completely energy beings. Let's say the Q are older than the um, Iconians, but the Iconians are up there in the scale of evolution. Yeah, so yeah, I agree with that. I think that's a good theory. I like that. And let's see, we've got a Dr. L. He says, I think Starfleet developed time travel somewhere in the late 25th to early 26th century because in an interview with Doug Dexler, Drexler, he said that the Enterprise J from the 26th century can time travel, causing it to not just explore the universe but also history. And for your question what the future Starfleet thinks about that weapon, the time ship USS Relativity, or at least this time shuttle Aeon, has temporal weapons too, so I don't think they consider that weapon unethical. My opinion, and this is Dr. L speaking, my opinion on the mission is that it is a good mission, but it has the potential to be much better. The Alliance sends so many ships, but you only fight in one group. It would be cool to have something in that mission, like helping more than one group in the battle, similar to that one Vodwar mission. And why are there only Klingon, Federation, and Romulan ships? Aren't the Talaxians of Kampa, Benthan, and so on also helping? Okay, yeah, a lot of good points here, and um, I agree. I didn't know that Doug Drexler said the Enterprise J could time travel. Of course, we only saw it in one episode of Enterprise, very briefly. Um, but it, it was from the 26th century. It is canon, whether you like Enterprise or not. The Enterprise J from the 26th century is canon. And if Doug Drexler says it can time travel, I guess it can time travel. So that means we are in that period of time here in the mid 25th century where time travel is starting to be developed by the more powerful uh, civilizations out there, like for example, the Federation. It makes sense that this is the time period where, where time travel would start becoming a common, a more common thing, something a little easier to do. So I could see that in a hundred years from now when the 26th century enterprise j comes along that it's a time traveling starship makes sense to me sounds good and also we know that there was another 26th century time traveler uh he was from a tng episode he time traveled back to the 22nd century and found the scientist 
guy, not really scientist, let's say the con man dude who stole his time machine, came into the future, the 24th century, and started stealing uh, Enterprise things. And then, of course, they caught him, and he I, he, I guess he stayed in the 24th century in the time pod, went back, I guess, to the 22nd century, where, where it was probably set to go. But anyway, it shows there were time travelers for sure in the 26th century. Also, there was a 27th century time traveler, I want to say, the... Um, Shoot, I forgot their names. You know, from that Risa episode with Picard and Vash. Oh, I can't believe I forgot their names. Oh, the Tox uh, uh, to- Utet, something like that. Uh, that wasn't the name of the race. That was the name of the artifact, anyway. It like stopped all, halted all nuclear fusion inside of a star or something like that. But anyway, they I think they were from the 27th century. But anyway, 26th century, definitely time travels, travelers. Okay, and uh, what, what would future Starfleet think about all these things? Uh, he says here that the Aeon and the Relativity had temporal weapons. Uh, they definitely did. There was one temporal weapon that the uh, Relativity tried to stop from destroying Voyager that would rip Voyager out of the timeline, basically. Then there was the Aeon, which basically was doing the same thing. It was um, it was a uh, beam emitted at Voyager to uh, basically remove it from time or something like that. Kind of a kind of a a rash thing to do, but he was misinformed as to how everything went down. But anyway, uh, same kind of weaponry, perhaps. It does seem very similar, like the uh, thing that they're building here with the, um, I can't believe I just forgot the name, the Crenum, the Crenum, uh, removing things from history, removing things from time, very similar type of technology, so I guess they do have that stuff as standard equipment on 29th century Starfleet ships. Um, so yeah okay I, I still don't know how they would feel about messing with time like this the only reason why he was trying to remove voyager from time was because he detected an explosion that basically uh, destroyed the entire solar system and he wasn't he was he was not operating on starfleet orders he was operating on his own his own kind of morality there which was um he detected that voyager caused it and so he went back in time to destroy voyager but that was not in order from Starfleet. Starfleet, I guess, was destroyed at that time. So I still don't know if they would think it's ethical or not because we don't know how they would order somebody in that situation to do something. Um, also, they're looking at this through time because we know future Starfleet can scan time just like they can scan space with sensors. They can scan time with sensors. So we know they're looking at this situation and kind of like watching us do it. I don't know. I guess they're allowing us to do it. So I guess that's our answer, huh? Um, I'm just going to kind of read through these before I read them on the microphone to see if they're relevant to talk about. Um, Dylan Van Tr- <laughs> Okay, yeah, let me try this. Van Trustenberg says, I think that thing in the middle of the research station is the Anorax Science Dreadnought. It kind of looks like it. Not sure, though. Uh, In the middle of the research station, you see like this big blue hatch thing. And I I was looking at it again as I replayed the mission, and I think you're right. I think that is the ship. That's the Dreadnought ship they're building with the time manipulation technology on it, just like he originally built in an alternate timeline. It's kind of the same ship. Um, if you look at it, turn your head and look at it sideways, it looks like the top part are like, I guess, where the engines are, maybe. Um, so yeah, it looks, it looks like that just turned or flipped upside down, or <laughs> something like that. So yeah, I think that's the ship they are working on. It's just uh, orientated weird to the station. Um, let's see. I'm just kind of reading through these again. I just want to pick out the ones to talk about here. John Black asked, which ship am I using in the mission? What did I play this on? I forgot what my character was here. Oh, I see. Uh, I am playing on 
my science character in this video. So I was on the tier six Intrepid, basically the uh, the Pathfinder, the tier six Pathfinder. Very very good ship. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, let's see what else do we have. John Black also goes on to say that he uh, often skips the dialogue because they can get a bit long-winded. I agree with you. Sometimes the dialogue in this game really, really gets, you know, ridiculous. Maybe they could dial that back a little bit, make it a little more engaging without the dialogue being so long. Uh, for, the, for, for the purpose of my Let's Play videos, though, I do need to go through all the dialogue because I don't want to miss any information. So I'm going to continue to read the dialogue in my videos. Uh, but yeah, I know that can get lengthy. Um... I already talked, Diego, Diego Diaz goes on to talk about what makes a flagship different. I kind of just talked about that but just a second ago. Um, let's see. Stry uh, Strifey says, I can understand your disappointment in this episode. It felt like a lot of loose ends. A cutscene showing devastating Iconian attacks might have just justify that assault more also like dr l said it was odd not to see any delta quadrant species ships the only thing i have to do disagree with is as soon as the weapon is finished they don't need that fleet anymore since they have that super weapon then which they can easily hide from the iconians oh he got he's got a lot to say here um yeah where are all the other delta quadrant species trying to help us i mean they all came together to help us fight the vodwar but where are they helping us trying to fight the Iconians? You know, the Benthans, the, uh, the, the Atare, the, uh, who else? The Voth, even. The Voth would be powerful. Um, where are all these Delta Quadrant species supposed to be helping us? They weren't in here. Just seems to be the Federation, Klingons, and Romulans. Uh... And then, yeah, what are they going to do once the weapon is finished? I mean, they're going to fire it once, solve the problem, and then what? Do they dismantle it? Who gets to keep it? It's, it can be abused. I mean, they, um, they, they can easily hide the weapon after they build it and then use it for evil purposes. I would be very worried about that. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read his post here. It's quite long, but he's got some good things to say here. This is uh, Streffy, Strifey. The only thing I have to disagree with is, as soon as the weapon is finished, yeah, okay, I uh, say, so still, that doesn't justify wasting a major part of the whole fleet for a massive assault against a sphere, so, a sphere so big that it measures the orbit of a planet in the habitable zone around a star. That thing should be filled with ships, but the resistance was unexpectedly weak. See, I feel the same way. Here's a freaking Dyson Sphere. Billions of ships inside. Even if it were just millions and not billions, where are they? Why well, it, didn't, it didn't feel like they were like help doing anything. He goes on to say, I know the sphere contains not only empty space, but also large facilities, but still, with the available volume inside the sphere, there should still they should still hide enough ships to crush the Milky Way resistance. Yeah, I mean, just with one sphere full of ships, they could crush the Milky Way, but they haven't. The Iconians haven't. Why, is my question. He goes on to say, also, I keep wondering what happens in the Gamma Quadrant. How does the Dominion deal with the invasion? How does the rest of the galaxy deal with it? There is still more unexplored than explored space in the Milky Way galaxy. Also, if the Herald Sphere was the only troop transport the Iconians had, that might explain the weak resistance. Maybe the ships they brought with them fight in every inhabited star system in the galaxy, so that would be spread out. 
I mean, that would be a good idea. What if they were fighting like every galaxy at once or something, you know, then I could feel like they were spread out. But they're, it seems like they've got this Herald Sphere, other Herald Spheres, as well as Dyson Spheres, as well as uh, Solonay stations they're trying to bring into our dimension. And yet they still don't seem like that big of a threat to me. Um... He goes on to say, but I'm also wondering why the Borg don't use the opportunity to strike. Seven clearly stated that the Borg pursued Iconian technology. It would be just logical that the Borg suddenly pop up, join the fight against the Iconians, capture valuable Iconian technology, then warp out again before they can be engaged and stopped. That's a good darn question. Holy crap. Why didn't I think of that? So here we are, the Federation, Romulan, Klingon, fighting at this Herald Sphere. Lots of devastation, lots of ships blowing up. If the Borg are seeking Iconian technology, wouldn't that be the perfect time to warp in with a cube or a sphere or whatever? Um, beam out, beam up some of this uh, technology that the Borg are after and uh, warp out before they could do anything? I sure would. That would be smart. Aren't the Borg that smart? Why aren't they doing that? Then you've got, yeah, what's, what about the Dominion? What does the Dominion think of this invasion? I mean, the Iconian invasion would affect them too, even if they are all the way in the Gamma Quadrant. Distance really is no problem for the Iconians. They're eventually going to take over it too. So what are the Dominion thinking? What are the Founders thinking? He goes on to say... They even could use that technology to secretly infiltrate the sphere and get the job done. Also, they could use that tech on a personal level to secretly invade the flagship. Invade the flagship. Personal cloaking tech wasn't unheard of. Just look at the Voth, for example, or the Jim Hadar. Yes. Yes, exactly. Why aren't they using like cloaking technology to steal technology? That's stealth. Why aren't they using it? Why it had to be uh, such an assault and any other means to show off, I don't know. Clearly they wanted to distract the Iconians, but the research facility and an extension of the galaxy sometime, but I still don't feel that was the right approach. The only good thing is that we confronted an Iconian for the first time ourselves, but still, you are right, this is uh, Steffi whatever speaking, that Iconian was stupid and just killed herself with her, with her constant appearing and disappearing. She even knew she burned her essence but did so apparently willingly. I can just imagine one for her to do so, to show other council member members how far the mortals have, go have, have gone, becoming a martyr so that they would finally agree to openly attack them, which they kind of did already. So, I mean, yeah, the, the you know, she, she, she kind of almost killed herself here. Also, like you said, why not staying in the Andromeda galaxy? Too much resistance there? And why is Iconia, their former homeworld, so important for them? The Solonay Sphere mission stated they wanted they wanted to recultivate their former homeworld. Is it just nostalgia, or is there more to it? Then it seems on first sight. Clearly, Iconians should be beyond things like nostalgia, and with whole Dyson spheres that can jump between galaxies, who needs a single specific planet anymore? Very good questions uh, this goes back to my question of what are the motives of the iconians do they just want to take over iconia a small little tiny planet they used to be on 200,000 years ago when they already have now gigantic freaking dyson spheres that can jump between galaxies when you have that why do you need this little tiny planet in the milky way galaxy it makes no freaking sense I guess we are still pretty far away from getting the full picture here. I guess there are still many secrets laying away for us. Maybe. Maybe that's all it is. It's just there's some things we don't know about. He goes on to say, another interesting bit. The inside of the Herald Sphere gives strange V'ger vibes. At least it reminds me pretty much of V'ger's designs. Is that just me or a coincidence? Or might there be some kind of connection? We already wondered about that with the Unimatrix 0047 command ships because their special plasma torpedo attacks disintegrated ships in a very similar matter and now the inside of the sphere looks kind of similar to probably just a coincidence I think that's just a coincidence because uh, I've got my own theories about what V'ger actually was and nothing in the original movie ever hinted about the Borg of course the Borg were, were not invented until TNG but still I don't really think v um, I know that Star Trek Online has made V'ger a Borg ship 
But I personally do not believe V'ger was connected at all to the Borg or the Borg homeworld or in any, any shape, form. I think it was another machine planet that's out there, a, an intelligent machine planet, and they built V'ger just like the movie says, but I don't think that's the origin story or have anything to do with the Borg. That's just my personal view. I go back to the novels on that. There's a, There are several origin theories for the Borg, and, the, and there are novels that go over those origin theories. Um, I like one in particular, um, and it has nothing to do with V'ger. But... Uh, I guess in game they have connected that V'ger with the Borg, so we just have to go along with it. Uh, but I don't think the V'ger has anything to do with the Dyson Spheres or the Iconians at all. Um, also, about the question, who has the right to use the weapon? I thought about it myself. Nobody should have the right, or everyone. Imagine a giant council composed of many members of all species that have been encountered yet. They all have to agree one voice for a temporal incursion, and because it's many members of each species, it should be impossible to bribe some single member of the council to agree to something. They probably wouldn't ever agree to an incursion as long as it isn't a galaxy-wide emergency. This is a very powerful weapon. I mean, nothing like this in Star Trek has been used except for in, in that actual TV show, but it was used wrongly. Uh, still, since this isn't such a... Yeah, so, you know, again, I don't, I don't know how this weapon thing is going to go down. After it's used, who gets to keep it? Who can? Somebody's going to steal the technology. Someone's going to hide it. Someone's going to use it for the wrong purposes. I feel it coming, and I, I the crinum really give me a creepy feeling for feeling for some reason. Um, Alex Hopkins asked, "How did you get the Breen Bridge officer?" Well, um, there was a special dealy thingy-majig back way when Star Trek Online started, and if you played uh, like those cold storage missions or whatever, you got a Breen called Tran. He was basically your a reward for convincing him to be a friendly Breen and come to your side and, and help you and all that. Uh, over time, they've often brought him back as a special mission reward for that. Um, but after they did that, they later uh, like redacted the whole thing and just made him available in the exchange. So yeah, you can literally just go to the exchange and buy Tran. So if you want a Breen Bridge Officer, look in the exchange. Actually, I don't even know if he's still there. This is season 10.5 now. It's been so long since they enacted that. Um, I'd have to go to the exchange and check, but you used to be able to go to the exchange and get him. <laughs> I know that. Uh, and he wasn't that expensive. He never really was. Once he went to the exchange, uh, prices on him were pretty cheap. Um... He was like he he was literally the first special bridge officer that they that they brought to the game. So like everybody wanted the Breen bridge officer when when he first came to the game. All right. Um. Ah, Earth. Uh, Ether twenty four sixty eight says, and this is my big question too: Why haven't the Iconians attacked Earth or Vulcan yet? Let's think about this. They have Dyson spheres full of ships, Solene stations, I mean, a massive army, and they've just been kind of stuck around the Iconia homeworld. Why haven't they attacked the big planets that are trying to attack them? Like, I know they tried to do something with Kronos, but they didn't really try. They didn't send their entire uh, army also that was the Undine I think not even it wasn't even the Iconians it was the Undine on that mission never mind thinking about a whole different thing why haven't the Iconians attacked Earth why haven't the Iconians taken over Earth why I mean if the Dominion can come down and take over San Francisco <laughs> the Iconians surely can take over the planet you know why haven't they tried to destroy Earth or why haven't they tried Vulcan why haven't they taken over core member worlds that would really, you know, pose a threat to the uh, to this whole alliance thing. Yeah, okay, they kind of tried with uh, New Romulus, but they didn't really try. I don't even know if they succeeded. Did they succeed in that mission? Because I forget. Uh, did we take it back over from them? I don't know what happened with the New Romulus, but they didn't try very hard. That's for sure. Um, yeah, T 
Tianxi uh, uh, Quan says, at least in DS9, the Dominion was able to occupy Beta Z and destroy San Francisco, while the Iconians haven't really done much at all so far. See, that's how I feel. That's how I feel. Um... Van de Velde Freya says, by the way, since when do Klingons care about civilian victims? Good point. Um, M. Koch says, the trope of a powerful being drawing its energy from machinery support is an old one in Star Trek. You've got Trelane, Landru, Apollo, Ardra. So it is very Trek. Okay, I'll give it that. It's very Trek. <laughs> Still kind of lame. Um, uh, jo Joanne D. says, Brent, you want to know their motive? Where is Iconia located? They want their origin world and galaxy back. They spent 200,000 years rebuilding their civilization from the brink of extinction. They actually talked about it over the course of the story. They were overthrown and have been stewing ever since. They are immortal, so they still remember it all because they were there in person and saw their world fall. Think of the Federation Lost Earth. Humans would want to reclaim it no matter how long it took. As for not being able to destroy the Dreadnought, it's simple. You were ordered to capture it by command and destroying one ship gets Alliance nothing. Capturing it, though, you can learn more about them and their tech. Blowing it up, also, you would not have killed Matara. She would have simply gated out. Then it would really just been for nothing. You said, why didn't Matara call for backup? Well, they even told, told you their arrogance. They view us as ants. So why call help just cause us herself? That's the arrogance. You point about showing us the urgency of the strike, I totally agree. They only hinted at the losses in the war and showed very little in missions and STFs. A few cutscenes of worlds being taken over would have helped with this. It reminds me of the Klingon War arc. There was hardly anything in that, sh in that to show any urgency at all as well. It was more like a Cold War, not a real one. I get that feeling. It's more like a Cold War, not a real one. All right, let's go through this because uh, you make some good points. Um, you wanted to know about their motive. Where is Iconia located? They, went, they want their origin world galaxy back. Well, I question why they want their origin world back. Again, as I said previously, and as someone else said previously, they've evolved way past that. They're energy beings now, and they have... Dyson Spheres, several, they got Solonay stations, they've got these huge things where they can live in any place in any galaxy in the universe. Why are they so concerned about this one tiny planet? Why would they want to confine themselves to a planet? You know, um, I still don't get why they want the planet. I mean, okay, they hold a grudge maybe, but it wasn't us who destroyed them 200,000 years ago. Humans were you know, still trying to make fire or whatever. We had nothing to, humans had nothing to do. Klingons had nothing to do. Romulans had nothing to do with the destruction of the Iconians 200,000 years ago. It was other races that don't exist now, like the Tikat, Tikalt. There's, there's, some, there's some race I can't remember. The Herc, maybe? Uh, there's all these races that were alive back then that fought them but they're not here now we weren't part of that why would they be mad at us why would they hold a grudge against somebody who they didn't even know back then so that makes no sense to me i still don't get it i just don't get it um let's see uh dun, dun, dun. as for not being ordered to destroy the dreadnought you wanted to capture it yeah well, there are easier targets to capture. You don't just go after the flagship with all of your fleet and, and hope you can make it. You go after a simpler target that you know you can take out and that won't cause you so many uh, casualties and destroy your entire fleet. You don't need the Dreadnought to learn about the Iconians or the flagship. You just you can get some other ships and learn about them. Um, Matara... 
being arrogant, not calling for backup. I can see that. Makes sense. That's, that's their MO, I guess. Okay, let's move on. Um, Ether2468 says, The Iconians really don't need ships. They can go wherever they please. They easily blew up the core worlds with a gateway and a really... They can, they, okay, huh. they can easily blow up the core worlds with a gateway and a really big bomb. You know, I agree. This is kind of like the Ori, where they could like just build a gate anywhere and then just send a bomb through. You know, what, this is exactly what the, um, the Iconians could do. They could just open up a gateway in the middle of the ocean on Earth where nobody could reach them. Or maybe even the center of the Earth, place a bomb... Blow up the earth or make a black hole. Put some red matter. You know, send some red matter through a gateway to the center of the earth. There you go. You could suck earth into a black hole just like Vulcan in that JJ movie that we don't want to talk about. You know, why can't they do something like that? Boom, problem solved. They don't even need to attack earth or attack with ships. They can attack with gateways and put a really big bomb through and blow everybody up. <laughs> so, what the hey? All right, Will Powell says, Brent, try to remember what came before this episode. All the storyline arcs lead up to the Iconian War. When you put it together, then you start to know what their motives are. Well, I, I remember all of them. I played them all, but I don't see what the story arc is still, or what their motives are, excuse me. Still don't get what their motives are. Why? Why, 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 why? Um... Should I play, or James Crow says, should I play it if I don't like space content and only ground? Well, I mean, it's a mix of ground and space. I guess you'll like half of it and the other half you won't. Uh, Dinkle Farts says, this mission was quite interesting and a bit weird. <laughs> okay. Um... Will Powell says, if you read the blog post called Tales of the Iconian War, you might understand the urgency of what is going on when dealing with the Iconians. That was sadly a chance where Cryptic could have incorporated that into the Iconian storyline in game and failed. I didn't know what this is. The uh, blog post called Tales of the Iconian War. I see, I'm not familiar with that. This is stuff they need to tell us in the missions, either through dialogue or through a cutscene or something. Because I'm not even know—I don't even know what that is, and I'm not sure anybody else does either. Uh, this is stuff that needs to be in the missions. Um, cuts, as someone said before, cutscenes of all the worlds being destroyed, taken over by Iconians, something like that. Show us the urgency here, uh, not just you know in a blog somewhere that nobody knows about, but show us in the mission. Uh, John Black says, just one more war. There has been war in this game for five years now. I'd love to see the game when all the wars are over. Good point. This game started on a war, the Klingon versus Federation War, and it's still at war. Now with the Iconians, it's been at war with the Undine. It's war, been at war with everything. I don't know if this game could survive without war. I don't know if the game would be interesting without war. You have to have space combat in, a, in an MMO like this. I don't know what the game would be like without combat. I'd probably be very boring. <laughs> probably. I think you have to have the combat. The question is how do you implement that into an interesting story? Because you gotta have it. You just can't not have that. I think. Good question though. Um, Darina Ramsey says once angered they may screw up i'm surprised nobody has gone to ask the borg for an alliance i agree where, where are the borg why aren't they taking advantage of this or why aren't we allying with them or are them allying with us um riley rakowicki says Mtaro was trying to prevent you from taking the ship makes sense um Uh, Luis Fernando Cavalcanti dos Santos <laughs> okay, says, People, there is no more cryptic, only perfect world. This mission is unnecessary and bad written filler. They could make that the Iconians were attacking the research station and you had to hold the line. That would be a better justification for battle. That I agree with. Poor use of Nog and Seven of Nine here. Where was the Enterprise in all of this? The Enterprise F is doing what? The whole premise of this war is far off. Borg, Dominion, the Prophets. 
Never even thought of the prophets. A galaxy-wide invasion, and they are doing what? After some of their posts on Facebook, I was really hoping to see a good story, well-written for the episode. Fur, I got shot in the back by Perfect World Entertainment. They are squishing the budget. Accepting this quality of storytelling, I'm sure this will still receive a lot of praise because of the pew-pew. Good point. You know, where is everybody? Where is the Enterprise F? A big battle like this, it would be there. Where is the board, the Dominion, the Prophets? These are good points. I also agree that maybe the premise wasn't so good in this mission. If the Iconians were coming to attack the research station because they knew we were building a weapon and we had to hold the line and stop them, that makes sense. The fact we went after this flagship makes no sense. Um, okay. Vosoros says, hang on a sec, why only a tier 6 long range science vessel? You can get a fleet tier 6 version now with a third tactical console slot. Well, resources. I don't have ship modules to go buy that fleet ship. Also, the fleet ship does not have the mastery portion, the uh, fifth mastery portion of the C store or Z store ships. So yeah, the fleet ship will have a slightly higher hull and a slightly higher shield capacity, but a fleet ship will not have the Starship Mastery, that the, the fifth Starship Mastery that comes uh, with the Sea Store ships. Also, you have to have the resources to buy one, and I don't have the resources to buy one. I'm not rich. <laughs> Suffice it to say, I wish I had all the money in the world to buy every ship and every combination of ship in the game. Unfortunately, I do not. So I will not be having every ship in the game. All right. Um, McDowell Morris says, I agree with you. I think helping the Crindom is a mistake. Look what happened when we helped the Vodwar. Yep. I think the Crindom are um, definitely scary. Nobody says, me thinks you should have played a Klingon instead. Kill it. Shoot it. Shoot it. Ha ha. Yes, Klingons do like that, but so can human doctors, <laughs> or whatever I am. Medallion, how do they think Iconians could not die? Why else would there be so few Iconians today? Versus when they have their first interstellar uprising. Good point. Kai Kaiki Avila says she didn't stop creating gateways because she didn't believe an Iconian could die. Well, she can believe it. She knows they can die. Because she's seen her friends die. Other Iconians have died 200,000 years ago. So they know that they can die. They know themselves. Um, Stephen Prochnak says, The reason we had to do the battle now is because if we didn't hit the Iconians hard enough, we were going to lose the war in a week or two. We wouldn't be able to finish the Krenum device in time. This mission brought us enough time to finish the device. I mean, they conquered Kronos, kicked our butt on New Romulus, and effectively are pushing us back. Well, I don't feel that. It doesn't feel like there's an urgency. Here I am on ESD and nothing's happening. It's a bright, beautiful day on Earth, and they're not even trying to attack Earth, so why am I worried? Um, no, I don't feel the urgency. Um, I don't feel like if we had to, we have to push them back. And plus, we failed anyway. We didn't do anything. Um, it didn't really hurt them that bad. Like I said before, they got billions of ships in Dyson Spheres. We, all of our fleet could not even punch a hole in that. I mean, I don't get it. Okay, let's see. Smedley Do Right says, Too bad they don't let you fly into that huge blob of ships. I want to try to find the Constitution ship, but like, looked like there was an overrepresentation of Rymelin ships. Also, wasn't Paris captain of the Geneva? Uh, Sovereign says, I think his daughter Meryl is captain of the Geneva. Okay. Um, Dole Moore says, it's like Wolf 359 all over. Um, Tonus and Sandry says, don't normally comment on YouTube stuff. By the way, thank you for commenting. But I got to say, I agree with a lot of what you say here, so I won't repeat you. But there is a couple of other points I want to mention from previous mention missions. Firstly, the two other Iconians that Matara summons, there was a golden opportunity to throw in some tension between the two of them. Taket being dead set on destroying us, and the other one preaching a more cautious approach. 
in Time in a Bottle, you saw this, and Matara was the one who said the campaign will now continue as planned, effectively keeping the two in line. If we have to accept that Matara is now gone, it would have been interesting to see tensions rise between the two. Not necessarily to the point of fighting, but definitely uh, some more tensions would have been nice. That could create the opening that helps end the war. Although I would have preferred Matara surviving, albeit weakened by what happened. Secondly, Taket. Oh, Taket. Apparently you are an energy being, and your energy is strangely tied into your ships. Can you not, not, you know, plug yourself into a ship and rebuild your arm, or am I missing something here? See, good points. Very good points from Tonus here. Um, we need some more interaction between the Iconians themselves. We need depth. What we really need is storytelling depth, and that's not what we're getting here. We're not getting that depth of storytelling. We need those layers to these Iconians, and we're not getting that. They just seem like that, uh, you know, mustache-twirling villain, cliched, nothing real depth-wise here. Also, um, why is their energy tied into ships? That's not a smart design. Uh, sorry, it's just not... Okay, Cryptic has tried to fill out this war scenario with a bunch of blog entries talking about the state of the war. If you read, this is from H.B. Haga, if you read that things do, do start to sound somewhat dire. That approach, however, lacks the dramatic element that we could have gotten from an F.E. or even a set-piece cutscene. Agreed. If all this is being said in a blog, I sure don't know about it, and I'm sure there's ma the majority of players who don't know about it. This needs to be in the mission. Um, he goes on to say, this particular mission, I don't know, a lot of it seems to rely on several people behaving stupidly. The Klingon Admiral, Matara, etc., when there was no clear reason for it. It didn't help that some of the cutscenes were just disjointed enough to muddle things up. I can see what Cryptic was going for. It could have been better if the drama had been ramped up with a good cutscene in the beginning to set the stage. Maybe then we could have had a sense of urgency and that's my thing too i don't feel the sense of urgency we're not that's not coming across it needs to come across star fury says it would also help if we noticed any difference in our day-to-day -day gameplay as i recall the last big thing i achieved was flying a jetpack on risa yes i mean here we are having a good old happy time on risa for the summer flying jetpacks and 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 spending time at the beach when apparently there's an iconian war going on outside see that don't make sense it don't connect where's the connection the legos don't connect the dots don't connect mflax says put the drama into the game Lots of people won't read the blogs, they just play the game. Yes, that's what I was saying. Put the drama in the game where the people play it. I don't read the blogs and neither does other people. HBAGA goes on to say, exactly, and that's where I think they missed the boat. There's nothing in-game other than the FEs that really address the war, and, the, and we've only got bits and pieces. What the SEP needed was a recap to set the tone. Totally agree. Nobody says when you have no context for the activities you are doing in game, it makes the characters all seem like Garth of Izar. Don't know the reference, but I agree. Inflax says in a game, the storytelling needs to be done in the game. You can add some addi some additional and not really necessary with stories outside of the game, but those stories usually stand on their own. To flesh out something in a game, you should never refer to something outside. We want to live that story in the game, and that is what Brent likes to have too. Lots of new stories and new episodes. Instead, they are revamping old episodes and get them out to the game. Quit the opposite of what is wanted. Bad choices. <laughs> Bad choices. Stan Gundam, okay, that was terrible. Stan Gundam says, "I like their up, upping the missions and what to expect, but I'm not really in for a time weapon. Is the only solution. I like that they're making the Iconians the big bad, that only drastic measures can deal with. But there are other options, such as the Echo Papa system from TNG Arsenal of Freedom." the boost ideas from TNG, the ninth degree and or Voyager Q and the gray. Each or both are good ideas for something new for players to use and and a thought has occurred to me that in that either the next mission or the one after this is going to have Sela and her mystery allies that she was talking about in the Iconia and Rep cutscenes. 
Another thought just came to my mind of them using the time weapon to move things under people who would have died, destroyed, forward in time where they can be saved and brought up to speed in what's happening. Those who have played or seen the game Star Trek Borg will get this. Cordell Garrett says, The Raiders get on my nerves constantly ramming the ship. I agree. I hate that. I was flying. I did this mission uh, just today, in fact, on a... Um, a phantom intel escort and those raiders when they hit your ship man my hole goes bye bye andrea Volun uh, volantova says i have always loved stowe for its storyline but sadly i have to agree this episode and the whole weapon project doesn't make sense to me either i also don't feel the pressure but then again those episodes are released once every four weeks maybe if you could play them all at once and the new stfs you would feel the iconian danger more and the floor isn't like lava. It's more like ice being lit from under, maybe by lava. But I love the interior design as well. It looks amazing. I agree. I like it too. What secondary deflector are I using, Brent? Well, I this from Kier C. I am using... I don't know what I'm using, actually. A deteriorating second deflector? I don't know. I'm using a secondary deflector that adds radiation damage. I know that. I don't specifically know the name of it offhand. I'd have to go look it up in my inventory. I don't want to mess up right now because he's talking and he looks awesome talking. So I'm going to leave him doing that. Uh, but it's it's a deflector that adds a bunch of radiation when you use things like Gravity Well and Tycan's Rift and stuff like that, which I use a lot on my science ship. So it adds radiation to that and does more damage, basically. Also, I think it might buff something like shields or something like that. It's a cool deflector. Um, maybe after I, at the end here, we'll look at it. Um, let's see. Mikey Adabert says, that was the main sphere. Yeah, that is the one from the Andromeda. I get it. But there are other ones, and they all, I guess, have ships in them. Or if even if just one has ships in it, they could still take over everything. That Psy Guy says, I've said it before, I'll say it again. We need Iconian red alerts, Iconian patrols, ground and space battle zones, a couple more STFs, and turn those Tales of War blogs into communiques accessible from our ready rooms. If this war is supposed to be the culmination of five years worth of missions, we do have to have that feeling of urgency. We need to see more from the three flagships, more from the leadership, and more from our sectors dis uh, disturbed. The patrols could be something simple, like the old exploration missions, randomly generate a supply caravan escort, rescue mission, repairing stations, or relays, anything. Give me immersion, for goodness sake. I totally agree, this, that psych guy. We need more stuff. You know, they gave the Voth an incredible battle zone on a Dyson Sphere. They gave the Undine a space battle zone. Uh, why do we not have Iconian battle zones? All we got was a few puny STFs, and no one even plays the Herald Sphere. Forget that one, because no one even plays it. You've got Brotherhood of the Sword and Gates of Grethor. Those two are the only STFs that really people play, and Bug Hunt a lot at endgame. But come on, no, nobody's playing Herald Sphere, so we need some battle zones. We need something to make this feel like a war. RG. MUFC1, a.k.a. Dr. Samus, says, I want Tier 6 fleet versions of this ship, but I think I'll buy Tier 6 Zen because my fleet is on Tier 3 base. That's lovely. Ethan says, You ever think the Iconians have conquered the Andromeda Galaxy and have now returned to reconquer their home? Maybe so, but still, why do they want a puny little planet in the Milky Way Galaxy? I don't know. I love your comments. I agree with you. Oh, this is from John Culver. I love your comments. I agree with you. If you remember... In Time in a Bottle, they said the other. Maybe the other is a power race or something. It kind of seems someone, or dare I say, something pulling the strings. Yeah, maybe there is another powerful race more powerful than the Iconians. That is certainly a sci-fi trope or cliche that gets used a lot. If there's, if there's always an alien, there's always some alien who's more powerful than that alien out there. So, <laughs> you know, very possible. Very possible. Maybe that's the Q. I don't know. The Q can do anything, right? Snap a finger and... There go the Iconians, so the Q could interfere here. I don't think the Q care, but the Q are definitely more powerful. Maybe the Q save the Iconians. Uh, I mean, it could make sense. Um, no idea who or what the other is, says Vendor Freya. John Culver says, my point exactly, or what is the other? I have a feeling we're about to find out, so maybe we'll see. 
Tim of Borg says, awesome video on mission. I also recorded it with my Klingon. Okay. HG Gundam Reviews says, Brent, since they have tied all this back to the TNG episode Schisms and the Enterprise episode Silent Enemy, they have in-game laid the groundwork that the Iconians have been planning a return and reconquest of the galaxy since they were driven out. So their motivations have been subtly laid out but they are there. I still don't know what that motivation is. I mean, is it just revenge? Is it just a grudge? Again, the humans and Klingons and Romulans had nothing to do with destroying or taking out the Iconians, so why are they mad at us? We had nothing to do with it. Why would they want to take back Iconia? They got it. They got a freaking Dyson Sphere right beside it. They own it. What the heck? Um... Cordell Garrett says, I had difficulty with the ground part for some reason. Yeah, I recommend something to buff your health a lot because it can go down a lot here. Now, your shields are going to go down a lot, but your health, yeah, get the health up. And um, fire, fire, lots of firepower, lots of firepower. Um, Nihilus Shadow says, according to the Preserver, it would have seemed the Iconians were the first race that evolved. The Iconians were given this galaxy to rule over. But I don't think so, though, because the Preservers created other races besides the Iconians. They wouldn't just say, okay, you can have the whole galaxy. No, they created other races, too, so I don't believe that. But it was taken from them, and they want it back. Yeah, but we didn't take it from them. Other races that don't exist took it from them. They don't want to rule just any galaxy because this one is already rightfully theirs. Why? What's so important about it? There's billions of galaxies out there. Why do they need this one? At least in their eyes. I am curious to know exactly why... Th what they did while in the galaxy in the andromeda galaxy in 200,000 years they would have had to interact with the natives in some capacity yeah i would think so also did you notice when you called in fleet support a command battle cruiser showed up i did i noticed that that was cool um the stargaze i agree that there are some big holes in the story as much as i love seeing nog tom paris is just strange direction to the story perhaps ranger Ranger 1 says an Iconian war should have the same tension as the Dominion War. Even ESD is not up to alert status. What will life be like after this war? More, most important, more characters from Star Trek need to be involved with the war. Don't forget to show the Resolute Heavy Cruiser. Okay. John Brown says Iconian's real power seems to be the ability to create immense fleets or armies of heralds and move them all wherever they wish. Maybe too early to, to fight an Iconian in person. Should have been, say, 10 waves of 100 enemies per just to get Matara, just to have her leave and be rescued. I would have liked to seen her leave. I would like to see her leave harmed, you know, but not have died. Only reason you're not worried is because you're overprepared. Lost boy. Um, I like being overprepared. I was a boy scout. <laughs> Maybe I still am. Um, Humpy123, if he says... They are attacking us because we are killing their heralds. Oh, put my game logged me out. Uh, hold on one second. So apparently I've been talking so long the game logged me out. Ha ha. Let's try to get through this. I know this is a long video, but these are all important. So I want to get to uh, everybody here. So bear with me. Um... Griggan says, or Humf, Humpy says, they are attacking us because we are killing their heralds and they don't want to be defeated by some alliance like it happened. That's why they're attacking us. Well, I mean, but they're, they're, we're attacking their heralds because they are attacking us. They attacked us first. Uh, Griggan says, I think everyone needs to ask one big question that has not been brought up yet. What is Section 31 doing? We know that, they're, that they... Ooh, that their own secret star system they use for time travel. We know they hoard tech of the week that has been collected since Toss. I get the feeling that they will do something that will start to tip the war in the Allies' favor. What it is, I don't know, but something tells me that it will be big. That and Sela might convince the Dominion to enter the war. Yeah, we're Section 31. We know they have a star system they use specifically for time travel. So what's Section 31 doing about this? Um... Hudeman says, you know, Matara sort of reminds me, Fry, uh, reminds me Fryza, both in attitude and arrogance, plus the voice is similar to, I don't know who that is. Anyways, I thought the fight was too easy. I am hoping our fight with Taket will be more difficult. 
I also agree that Cryptic has not done a great job making us feel like we are fighting for survival against a superior power. They said at one point that Season 10 was about wrapping up the Iconian story, and it really is starting to show. This whole story just feels rushed. They could have at least added Herald Red Alerts to make us feel like we are under attack. Yeah, I feel like it's rushed too, and I think a lot of people do. Uh, where do you get the mission? In-game, of course. Um, Frost Wolfpack says, as other people have said, that why not blow up the ship was to take it over. Maybe the smaller ships are remote controlled and can't be boarded. I mean, it's possible, but I doubt it. And then there's cruisers, which would be easier than a dreadnought. So why the dreadnought? Medallion says they don't want to blow up the flagship. They want to capture it. Yeah, we went over that. John Culver says it was kind of both of them who developed a temporary shield. Seven of Nine got that info and from the torpedo, and Tuvok and Seven both worked on the design. So yeah, I think it would have been cool to have you know, Tuvok in this mission. He really needs to be in this mission, in all these missions, because he's part of this. Tristan says, hey, Brent, on August 6th, when you make your video, can you say happy birthday to me? Okay, well, I'll, I'll just go and say it early. Happy birthday, Tristan Anderson. That's your early birthday. Jerry, this says, you raised some good questions as to what the Iconians really want and the idiocy of a frontal assault. I'm hoping our meddling with time eventually will result in a diplomatic solution where we go back and undo this attack and save Matara and the fleet. Now, wouldn't that be cool? You know, like, re totally reverse everything we've done in this entire war, save Matara, and have a diplomatic solution. That would be so Star Trek instead of just blowing everything up or changing time. You think Cryptic will do it? No. But wouldn't that be epic? be so different and awesome. Uh, Dyer Maidman says, do you think this time weapon starts the Temporal Cold War? I suppose it could if they wanted to tie it into the Temporal Cold War. We don't know what time period the Temporal Cold War started, except it was going on in the 26th century. Might be a little too early for it, but it could start it. I really don't want to revisit the Temporal Cold War. I kind of just want to forget that that ever happened in Enterprise, <laughs> to be honest with you. Matthew Brune says, or in the case of that suicide run, is the more they uh, overthink the plumbing, the easier it is to stop the drain. Maybe. Medallion says, the thing in the middle of the research lab is the Anorak's temporal science vessel, or temporal vessel. Yep, I think so too. Kyla says, what if Kalis didn't die? Well, then he'd be alive. Uh, maybe that they could reverse that with the time thing. I still want to, I still want to know what happened to the uh, sword of Kalis. They left it on that Iconian colony and never got it back. Chris Grin says, personally, I think Hagrin's got himself a nasty little bug, if you know what I mean. Yo, oh, oh, Chris Grin, you're thinking out of the box, man. I, I give you kudos to that one. Perhaps he's infected with one of those, um, what do they call them? Bluegills. That's what they call them. The Vodwar, the Iconian bug, Iconian created bug, or Sol Solanae created bug that the Iconians used to um, manipulate people. They did it with the Vodwar. Maybe they're doing it with Cogrin so that they will waste the fleet or destroy the fleet and be able to take us over easier. Ooh, now that's thinking out. That's thinking out of the box right there, my friend. Nathaniel says, I'm still on tier three. Too bad I've got school starting up. Yep, school sucks. <laughs> no, school's great. Soap Mops says, Brent, when the time comes, could you make your Klingon free-to-play character a Nausicaan? Maybe. I don't know. I don't like Nausicaans. They're kind of ugly. John Brown says, when the power consoles on the ship were closed, the Iconian could not use that power to open gates, so we had to use her power, thus weakening herself. The gates were inside to bring defenders to her and outside to continue the space battle. Yeah, not blowing up the flagship. It was just a one ship, perhaps a billion, so what? It was a chance to study the tech inside the ship. I, I still think, though, why go for such a, a, you know, a hard ship, a dreadnought? Go for a smaller ship. Um, Delta Centaur says, in my opinion, the developers had a nice concept with the Iconians, but they're portrayed as a bit too powerful for any coherent logical storytelling. See, it takes several Federation capital ships to keep up with one Herald battleship, and they literally have millions of them at their disposal. Why again haven't they overrun any of the 150 Federation capital worlds yet? 
Well, who knows? Maybe they're busy fighting some bigger enemy in the Andromeda Galaxy. Yeah, maybe. We know there is one race from the Andromeda Galaxy. We met them in Toss, the original series. I forget what they were called, but they were a race from the Andromeda Galaxy, and I think... Boy, you guys can tell me if I'm right on this or recall back. I think they mentioned there was a lot of devastation in the Andromeda Galaxy. There was, a, there was some kind of war. There was something. There was a lot of after after stuff, like after war stuff in the Andromeda Galaxy. It's very possible the Iconians had something to do with that. I forgot what that race was called from the Andromeda Galaxy 2, by the way. Um, but I think that's a thing. I have to look it up. Uh, Rocket Girl is, says, I've had a theory for some time now since we keep hearing about them in the next featured episode or if there's another one after that. My theory is that at some point the other will show up and try to save the Iconians again. And when we try to use the time ship, which I have had the chance to watch the Year of Hell episodes... To better understand the Crinum and the time ship, I'm scared of that ship. I'm more scared of using it, but that's my theory. I have another one. It's small. Some would think it's silly and not possible, but what if by some weird chance we're the other that may be a long shot, but it's a very small theory. I kind of like that idea, but we weren't around back then to save them. It says the other saved them back then. Well, we weren't here to save them unless we time traveled back to save them. Oh my gosh, I just had the most awesome thought. Thank you for that theory, by the way, because it has created another theory in my head. What if we use this time ship and somehow we get sent back into the past 200,000 years ago when the Iconians were at war with these other races and we are the ones that saved them, just like you said, we become that other. We save them, and in return, later here, now in the future, or present time, or whatever, we reach a diplomatic agreement because we were the ones that saved them 200,000 years ago. All it takes is a little time travel, and apparently, we can do that. Oh my gosh. It's like a predestination paradox in a way, but in a cool, cooler way. <laughs> and... Oh, wow. It's almost like, uh, again, another spoiler, uh, Babylon 5 spoiler here. It's almost like um, Valen, you know, that whole thing about, um, uh, I can't believe I just forgot his name. You know what I'm talking about, though. The first commander of Babylon 5, <laughs> Sinclair. Dang, how, how can I forget his name? Uh, becoming Valen, you know, like going back into the past and becoming Valen. Something like that is just epic. That's epic storytelling. Now, that was cool for Babylon 5. Can they do it in Star Trek Online and make it rel make it awesome? Well, I guess so, but that would be so cool. I want that now. Bad. Okay. Ether says, This mission was a waste on a plot and story level. The Iconians were poor antagonists on paper in the Star Trek continuity. The Iconians were mysterious. Yep, they used to be mysterious. Just like always happens. This happened with the Ancients in, Star, in Stargate. There's, the, the aliens are always mysterious until they use them too much. And then they're just stupid. Um, Tom Clomfar says, Well, Iconians can't be so weak. They were a threat to... Q Q. I don't think they were a threat to Q. Um, content is slow, says Drazen. Okay. Sorry. Sonic Halo says, I think the reason they wanted to board the ship and not destroy it was to take the ship. Yeah, I get it. I don't know why. Personally, from watching this and reading everything on the still webpage, I felt as if they need to do more missions where the... Iconians are actually a threat. Totally agree. I think everyone's on the boat with that. For being, as the Inflax says, for being so successful in the past, they sure show very poor strategies in the war. The most difficult war ever expected. It should be treated treated that easy going way. I agree. I mean, the, the Iconians are smart. They're energy beings. They've lived for more than 200,000 years. They should know strategy like, you know, not, like nobody else. They should have smarts. And it don't seem like they're smart. <laughs> Seems like they're kind of dumb. 
Jodo says, let me explain how you win the war. You take the phasing cloak from TNG, the Pegasus, combined with a protomatter device from DS9 by Inferno's Light, and you fly a small ship or warhead into every sphere or fleet, and you win. Easy. Now shut up, you stupid storyline authors. <laughs> See, that, that, that is an easy fix, but it is canon, you know? All they have to do is get a phasing cloak. Which I love that episode, by the way. That was a great episode. But yeah, phasing cloak. You fly a a warhead into the center of a Dyson sphere, and you blow it the crap up. Even if you don't have one of those proto devices, get a Genesis device. They got. I mean, that's an old technology by now. That would sur surely destroy a Dyson sphere. I mean, they have the weaponry to destroy that that kind of stuff. They do, and they have phased cloak so they could fly right through the hole of a Dyson sphere and not ever be detected or seen or any way to you know attack them because the weapon fire would just go right through them being phased so phase cloak through a Dyson sphere and blow it up just do it to all of them end of story that's Star Trek that's canon it would work okay Wow, this has been an extremely long video, but this has been, I hope, successful. I want to thank everybody who has left a comment in that video. I got to all of you guys. So to everybody I mentioned, a big shout out and thank you for all of that information. I love discussing this and getting some ideas out there about this. And I think most of us are on the same page about the Iconian storyline here. Um, drop me a line in the comments on this video. Let me know what you think. Let us know if you stayed through the entire video to listen because I know this turned out to be extremely long, but I think extremely worth it. Let me know if you want me to do this again in other videos, maybe a culmination of videos after some time, you know, um, on this kind of stuff. Let me know if that's important to you, if you like it. Um, and there you go, guys. I'm going to uh, leave it there. Uh, let's, one thing I did, I do remember the person who asked what secondary deflector I was using, and I just so happens I am on that character. So here's the second deflect, secondary deflector. Oh, uh, that's not it. This one here. This is an inhibiting secondary deflector, Mark 13, SA plus heal, SH, SIS, and SIF. What all that does is Starship Structural Integrity improves ship hit points. Starship Shield Systems improve shield hit points by plus 14. Improves sensor analysis healing buff by 20%. And it gives a moderate radiation damage to these abilities. Jam sensors, tractor beam, tractor beam repulsors, scramble sensors, gravity well, and photonic shock wave. And I do use tractor beam. Beam, I think and I definitely use gravity well all the time so that adds a moderate radiation damage to those abilities with a 50% shield penetration on that uh, moderate radiation damage so that is the inhibiting secondary deflector with S8 plus heal, Shy, Sys, and Sif that is the secondary deflector I use I need to upgrade it to 14 right now it's at 13 but uh, very good secondary reflector. Now Now that the research station holding is out, however, I believe there are better secondary deflectors, but I will probably find something along this path here. I like the ability of it to improve my ship hit points, my ship shield points, as well as add radiation damage to those science abilities I'm using. Just helps me do a little more damage. So there you go, secondary deflector, hooray. Okay. Now, thank you all for watching this video, and stay tuned for the next one.